The city is for some glamorous, stimulating, prosperous. Only recently has it become dangerous. Between 1962 and 1964, the city of Boston was plagued with a drastic increase in crime rate. And what's worse, the increase was brought about by a series of home break-ins and over a dozen murders. It was America's most notorious serial killer, torturing and murdering 13 women, while his identity remained shrouded in mystery through it all. In today's video, I'll be telling you the story of the Boston Strangler, revealing his true identity and recounting the events that ultimately led to his arrest. The Making of a Strangler Albert Henry DeSalvo was born to Frank and Charlotte DeSalvo on the 3rd of September 1931 in Chelsea, Massachusetts. While many children born in that era were privileged to grow up in a somewhat enabling environment, the same cannot be said for Albert DeSalvo. DeSalvo grew up in a home filled with violence and physical abuse, most of which came directly from his father, an alcoholic. Young DeSalvo watched his father beat his mother to a pulp on numerous occasions. What little time Frank didn't spend physically assaulting his wife, he spent with sex workers. Sometimes he would even go as far as bringing these women into his home and engaging in sexual acts with them right in front of his wife and little children. All in all, Frank DeSalvo was a very heartless man whose violence knew no bounds. One day, he beat his wife Charlotte so mercilessly that he knocked out all her teeth and broke all her fingers. In line with his depraved habits, Frank ensured his children had front row seats to witness it all. Frank and Charlotte got divorced soon after that incident, and the day of the divorce marked the last time the DeSalvo family saw or heard from Frank. While it was quite a relief that Frank was out of the picture, the damage seemed to have already been done. Constantly witnessing such violence at such a young age took its toll on the young DeSalvo, so much so that he began torturing animals as a child and started shoplifting and stealing in his early adolescence. Despite being very young, it was clear to all that Albert had found his place on the wrong side of the law and was determined to hold on to it. In November of 1943, DeSalvo was arrested for battery and robbery. He was just 12 years old at the time, so he was sent to the Lyman School for Boys in December of that year. About a year later, DeSalvo was let out on parole. Fresh out of the system, a seemingly reformed DeSalvo started working as a delivery boy, but this positive development only lasted for a short period. In August of 1946, DeSalvo was sent back to the Lyman School for stealing a car. 17-year-old DeSalvo completed his second sentence in 1948 and decided to turn over a new leaf, or so it seemed. He joined the US Army, where he changed his life for the better. He worked hard and got stationed in Germany, where he met and married his wife, Imgard Beck. Shortly after tying the knot, the couple returned turned to the US and made a home for themselves in New Jersey. After his first tour, DeSalvo was honorably discharged, but he re-enlisted for a second time. Some accounts claim that around this time, DeSalvo was tried for abusing a young girl in her home, but the charges were later dropped. This scandal allegedly led to DeSalvo being honorably discharged for the second time, deciding it was indeed time to let go of his military background and forge ahead. DeSalvo and his wife moved to Boston, Massachusetts to start a family. As it turns out, DeSalvo's move to Massachusetts marked the beginning of the mysterious deaths of women all over Boston. The era of the measuring man and the birth of the strangler. Shortly after DeSalvo's arrival in Boston, different women began to report a series of sex-related crimes. In their police reports, most of the women claimed that a man had come into their homes, claiming he worked for a modeling agency and wanted to take their measurements. According to the victims, after the man managed to convince them that he meant no harm and gained entry into their homes, he would proceed to charm them by making them feel attractive and suggest that they change into a leotard. The strange man would then pull out measuring tape to take the measurements. But in reality, these tapes were used as an excuse for him to get up close and personal with the women who he would then go on to molest. Soon, the authorities and the concerned citizens of Boston tagged the mysterious man, the measuring man. Thanks to the numerous complaints that had been filed, the police were on high alert searching for the measuring man. And so it didn't take long before Albert DeSalvo was arrested for breaking and entering into a woman's home. Seeing how he had been caught red-handed, DeSalvo quickly confessed to being the measuring man. After undergoing a psych evaluation, DeSalvo was diagnosed as a sociopath and sentenced to 18 months in jail for his crimes, but was released after 11 months in April of 1962. Contrary to what the world was hoping for, the months Albert DeSalvo spent in jail were not enough to change him. Instead, it seemed like jail time was the fuel he needed to begin the next phase of his life. As soon as DeSalvo regained his freedom, he went into full monster mode and terrorized Boston and its neighborhood 
neighborhoods from 1962 until 1964. DeSalvo was no longer satisfied with molesting women while pretending to be someone he was not. He had acquired a taste for blood while behind bars and was willing to go to any lengths to satisfy this new depravity. The women who were unfortunate enough to encounter DeSalvo after his release from prison were killed in their homes. Nearly all of them were sexually abused before being strangled to death with articles of clothing that belonged to them. The Boston Strangler's first victim was 55-year-old Anna Slezers, a seamstress who lived alone in Boston's Back Bay neighborhood. She was found dead around 7.45 p.m. on the 14th of June, 1962, by her 25-year-old son, who had come to drive her to church. Anna Slezers' son found her lifeless body in the hallway next to the bathroom and assumed she had used her bathrobe tie to hang herself, but that wasn't the case. When Boston Police Special Officer James Mellon arrived at the scene, he noted that the tub was partly filled with water and that there were freshly baked muffins in the kitchen. He also noticed how Slessor's robe was opened below her shoulders to expose the rest of her naked body. After piecing together these observations, Mellon immediately knew that Slessor's didn't kill herself like her son thought she had. He knew that she had been murdered. The Killing Spree in the weeks after the murder of Anna Slessers, investigators were still trying to wrap their minds around the baffling nature of the crime. Unknown to them, there was more to come in the following weeks. On June 30th, 1962, two weeks after Anna Slessers was discovered, the Boston Strangler struck again. 68-year-old Nina Nichols didn't show up at her sister's house for dinner, so her brother-in-law called her apartment manager and asked him to check in on her. When he got into her apartment, the apartment manager found Nichols lying on the bedroom floor. She had been strangled with a pair of her own stockings. The house coat she had been wearing at the time of her death was pulled up to her waist, exposing her naked lower body. Even though the police were now hot on his heels, the Boston Strangler, as he had been tagged by the media and authorities showed no signs of slowing down. The next victim was found shortly on July 2nd, and her name was Helen Blake. After noticing that Helen had been gone all weekend without any prior notice, a pair of concerned neighbors decided to take matters into their own hands. Determined to make sure that Helen was okay, the neighbors found a spare key to her apartment and decided to go take a look. Nothing could have prepared the two well-meaning fellows for the sight that greeted them on the other side of that door. After letting themselves in, the neighbors found 65-year-old Helen lying face down and unmoving on her bed. Her pajamas had been pushed up over her shoulders, exposing her body. Helen Blake, like the first two victims, had been strangled with her stocking. But this time, there was a twist. In what can only be described as a sick attempt at humor, the killer tied the ends of Helen's bra into a bow under her chin. After thoroughly examining the crime scene and Helen's body, the authorities placed her date of death as the 30th of June, the same day Nina Nichols was killed. At this point, the Boston Strangler's M.O. was well established. He was known to strangle his victims and then tie a bow with either the stocking or bath robe tie he had used to commit the crime. Sometime in August, another victim was found dead on the living room floor of her Boston West End apartment. 75-year-old Ida Irga had been manually strangled, but she had a pillowcase tied around her neck to create the illusion that she'd been killed in the same manner as the other victims. After the fourth victim was found, news of the strangler's activities began to fly around, causing fear to spread throughout Boston. Stores and shopping complexes all over the city witnessed an influx of customers looking to purchase padlocks, chains, security alarms, and even guard dogs. Dogs. Some people went as far as purchasing tear gas for personal use, but it made sense because a serial killer was on the loose and no one had any idea what he looked like or who his next victim could be. Women became apprehensive towards men. The fear was such that they wouldn't even let uniformed police officers into their apartments. The detectives assigned to Irga's case had to interview scared neighbors while standing on the other side of locked doors. Less than a week after Ida Irga was killed, 67-year-old Jane Sullivan was found dead in her apartment in Dorchester, a town across from where Irga was killed. She too had been strangled with her stockings and was left in a kneeling position in her bathtub. Her face and forearms were a few inches into the water. Upon further examination, the authorities learned that Jane had been dead for a few days before she had been found. While still trying to confirm that the recent string of murders were indeed related, investigators noticed that although the woman who had been killed was strangled with different articles of clothing, these clothing articles all had something in common. They were all tied in a granny knot. The Last Victims for a few months after the brutal murder of Jane Sullivan, no news was heard about the activities of the Boston Strangler, and it almost seemed like normalcy had returned to the city of Boston. Unfortunately, this normalcy was short-lived because on the 5th of December, 1962, the body of 20-year-old Sophie Clark a nursing student who lived with two roommates in Back Bay was found. Telltale signs found on the body showed that Sophie had been sexually assaulted and strangled with her own stockings. Another thing worthy of note was that this time, semen was found near the body. On December 31st, about three weeks after Sophie Clark's murder, 23-year-old Patricia Bissett was found dead. She too had been strangled to death with a pair of stockings that belonged to her. After a few months of relative silence, 
Boston Strangler continued his criminal legacy in May of 1963 when 23-year-old Boston University grad student Beverly Sammons was found dead by her fiancé in her Cambridge apartment. Reports say she was found lying on her pull-out couch, her wrists were tied using a sequin-studded silk scarf, and her neck was tied with her stockings. While the scene matched the Strangler's M.O., there was something that differentiated Sammons from all the other victims. She had been stabbed 22 times, and the stocking around her neck had not been used to strangle her. While one school of thought believes that Beverly Sammons may have been killed by a copycat. Others were of the opinion that things got out of hand for the Boston Strangler during this attack, so he resorted to using a more brutal approach and only added the stockings as a way to announce himself. On September 8th, 1963, 58-year-old Evelyn Corbin was found in her apartment in Salem. This time, it seemed the Boston Strangler decided to get a little more creative with his M.O. Corbin had been strangled with her stockings. Her underwear was stuffed into her mouth. As if that was not enough, a different pair of stockings were used to tie a bow around her left ankle. On November 23rd, 1963, 23-year-old Sunday school teacher Joanne Graff was raped and strangled in her apartment. She had bite marks on her left breast, and the stocking around her neck was tied into a bow. The last of the Boston Strangler's victims was found dead on January 4th, 1964. On that fateful day, two roommates returned to their Beacon Hill home to find that their third roommate had been killed. 19-year-old Mary Sullivan was killed and propped up in bed. Of course, her stocking was around her neck, but this time the Boston Strangler added a finishing touch. He tied a pink silk scarf into a bow around her neck. The search for answers. When a police investigation carried out at the early stages of the Boston Strangler's crime spree showed that Nichols and Blake were killed on the same day, the authorities knew that they needed to get ahead of the situation. Unfortunately, the 911 emergency number had not been established at the time, so the police set up a 24-7 emergency hotline. They then encouraged women to keep being more security conscious, to not let any strangers into their homes, and asked them to dial the hotline if they noticed any suspicious people around their house. Police Commissioner Edmund McNamara didn't want the people's fear to escalate into mass hysteria, so he made sure that not much information about the Strangler's activities was released to the public, while he had good intentions for doing so in identifying the killer. The police, led by McNamara, were doing everything possible to catch the Strangler, but there was one big problem. Whoever the culprit was, he knew exactly what he was doing. He was good at covering his tracks and made sure he left no physical evidence behind. This, in turn, made it next to impossible for the police to identify any suspect. Every available cop was assigned to work on the murders, and dozens of detectives were sent out to attend an FBI seminar on sex crimes. In the meantime, the police hotline began to blow up. Several women were calling in with reports of men disturbing them. It turned out there were a lot of men bothering women at the time, even though they were not all serial killers. As fear and panic heightened around the city, the Boston Herald ran an editorial with the intention of calming the people down. The article stated that the chance of being a victim of the Boston Strangler was almost nil. Another paper, the Boston Advertiser, published a front page open letter to whoever the Strangler was, beckoning on him to contact the paper to get help. With no physical evidence being found at the crime scenes and zero suspects, the police were at their wit's end, so they began to interview dozens of men who were caught peeping, loitering, acting strange, or just out right drunk. Through it all, the hotline kept blowing up with calls from women who were convinced they knew who the Strangler was. One woman went as far as compiling a thick dossier of her neighbor's movements because she was convinced he was the killer. Another woman called the hotline to report her cheating husband as the killer, even when she knew he wasn't. Aside from the police, there were a handful of people who were dedicated to finding the culprit behind the brutal murders. At the forefront of this crusade were Loretta McLaughlin and Jean Cole. The two women worked for the Record American newspaper in the 1960s, and despite having to face the challenges of working in a male-dominated line of work, they both fought tooth and nail for the opportunity to tell the stories of the unfortunate victims. Their first article regarding the Boston Strangler was published in January 1963 with a headline, Two Girl Reporters Analyze Strangler. The pair are also credited with being the first people to connect the murders and break the story of the Boston Strangler. Despite their best efforts and the assistance they received from independent investigators and journalists, the authorities were grasping at straws, and the chances of the Strangler being caught grew slimmer and slimmer with each passing day. The Last Straw The Boston Strangler had left a trail of dead bodies in his path, unknown to him that the end of his killing spree was near and he would have to face the law for those heinous acts. The last straw that brought the Boston Strangler to book happened on October 27, 1964. A 20-year-old newlywed called the police to report that she had been tied up and sexually assaulted in her apartment in Cambridge. She told the police that the man threatened her with a knife to her throat. He told her not to look at him, but she somehow managed to get a good look at his face. She also told the authorities that just before he left, the culprit apologized to her. In the report, the victim gave the description of a man who looked 
looked like the criminal known as the Measuring Man. In the past, Albert de Salvo had admitted to being the Measuring Man and had spent two years in jail for his crimes. Jail time that turned out to be the beginning of his reign of terror in Boston. On November 3, 1964, 33-year-old Albert de Salvo was arrested for the October 27 assault. He was released on $8,000 bail. However, the police went ahead to send out his picture over the police teletype network. Soon enough, calls began coming in from Connecticut. The Connecticut authorities were on the look for a sexual assailant they called the Green Man because he wore green work pants and DeSalvo fit the profile. It seemed as though the universe had taken enough of DeSalvo's bloodletting and was ready to make him pay for his sins. On November 5th, DeSalvo was arrested again. This time, he refused to say a word to the police until his wife arrived at the station, and some accounts claim he was mortified that she would see him in handcuffs. Eventually, DeSalvo confessed to his wife in the presence of authorities that he had done some very bad things, ranging from rape to break-ins, but he claimed he had never committed murder. According to reports of the incident, DeSalvo's wife, Irmgard DeSalvo, didn't show any signs of surprise or shock after hearing her husband's confession. She only encouraged him to come clean and tell the police everything he had done. Heeding his wife's counsel, DeSalvo admitted to the crimes of the Green Man. He said that he had broken into over 400 homes and claimed that there were a couple of rapes the police didn't know about, but through it all, he vehemently denied knowing anything about the Strangler's victims. Following these alarming revelations, DeSalvo was diagnosed as a sociopath with schizoid features and depressive tendencies and was transferred from jail to Bridgewater State Hospital. The court ruled that he was incompetent to stand trial for the rape cases and was to remain in the psychiatric hospital from the 4th of February 1965 till further notice. George Nassar, fellow inmate turned confidant. Albert de Salvo supposedly became friends with George Nassar, a fellow inmate at Bridgewater State Hospital in Massachusetts, where both men were incarcerated and undergoing mental health evaluations. At the time, George Nassar was in custody, serving a life sentence for shooting and killing a gas station attendant in Massachusetts. De Salvo reportedly warmed up to Nassar to the point that he started telling Nassar details about the murders that only the Boston Strangler himself would know. After hearing de Salvo's confessions, Nassar quickly contacted his lawyer, F. Lee Bailey. DeSalvo then confessed to Bailey on tape that he had killed 11 women, including 69-year-old Mary Brown, in March 1963. He also revealed that another victim, 85-year-old Mary Mullen, died of a heart attack right in front of him. Hungry for recognition and perhaps driven by intrigue, Bailey took up DeSalvo's case and decided to represent him in court. In court, Bailey argued that DeSalvo was too mentally unstable to be guilty of rape. Aside from Bailey's claims, the assistant attorney general and other investigators had their doubts about DeSalvo confession. There were speculations that Nassar was the actual Boston Strangler, but was trying to clear his name by pinning the killings on DeSalvo, who had been tagged mentally unstable. In the summer of 1965, Assistant Attorney General conducted a series of interviews with Albert DeSalvo. He hoped he could get the truth out of DeSalvo to make sure he wasn't being manipulated by Nassar into taking the fall for the Boston Strangler's crimes. During the interviews, DeSalvo was able to describe some of the Strangler's crimes in detail. This accuracy led the detectives to start believing that he was indeed the dreaded killer. Things got more interesting when DeSalvo spoke correctly about a detail that the news had published wrongly because of an error in the police report. The interview lasted for more than 50 hours put together and produced up to 2,000 pages of transcripts. The transcripts show that some of the statements made by DeSalvo could not be proven. Regardless, much of the things he said were correct and the investigators could verify them in detail. With all the evidence before the police added to his confessions, DeSalvo was found competent to stand trial for the Green Man rapes in June of 1996. DeSalvo pleaded not guilty, and his lawyer, Bailey, argued that the jury should consider his client an insane man in dire need of psychiatric help. Bailey's arguments held no water before the jury. And so, on January 18, 1967, DeSalvo was convicted of 10 counts of rape and armed robbery and sentenced to life in prison. The End of the Strangler DeSalvo was at the end of the road. Now, more than ever, it was clear to him that he had started a journey that led him to his end. In February of 1967, just a few weeks after he was sentenced, DeSalvo escaped from Bridgewater State Hospital with two fellow inmates. Once again, the man who was thought to be the Boston Strangler was on the loose. News of DeSalvo's escape put local authorities on their toes, and it ultimately triggered a full-scale manhunt. While searching for clues, the police found a note under DeSalvo's bunk, which was addressed to the prison superintendent. DeSalvo said he needed to escape in order to focus attention on the condition 
conditions in the hospital and his own situations. The manhunt, aimed at recapturing DeSalvo, lasted for just three days because DeSalvo himself called his lawyer and turned himself in. Bailey then called the police, and shortly after, the serial killer and rapist was rearrested in Lynn, Massachusetts. No one could tell what DeSalvo had done with his three days of freedom or why he called his lawyer to turn himself in, but people found solace in the fact that he was back in custody. To ensure that DeSalvo remained in custody, the authorities transferred him to a maximum security prison formerly called Walpole, but is now known as Massachusetts Correctional Institute. After his escape attempt, DeSalvo remained in prison, and this marked an end to the murders and sexual assaults connected to the Boston Strangler. The city of Boston had finally found peace and quiet. On November 25th, 1973, tragedy befell DeSalvo. He was found dead in the prison infirmary, and further investigation showed that he had been stabbed to death. However, no one knew who could have done it. Since he was found dead in a prison, the most likely suspects were his fellow inmates. Two prisoners, Robert Wilson and Richard Devlin, who were affiliated to the Winter Hill Gang, were accused of being responsible for the crime. The pair were charged and tried for the death of DeSalvo, but the trial ended with a hung jury, and no one was ever convicted for his murder. DeSalvo's lawyer, Bailey, later stated that he was killed for selling drugs in prison for less than the general market price to inmates. Was he or was he not? Although Albert DeSalvo has been convicted for some of his crimes and sentenced to life imprisonment, there were still people who had doubts about his involvement in all the murders. Two of such people were DeSalvo's brother Richard and Mary Sullivan's sister Diane. Mary Sullivan was the Boston Strangler's last victim, but her sister thought Albert DeSalvo wasn't responsible for Mary's death. In the early 2000s, Richard and Diane worked hard to get the case reopened. However, they weren't able to get the answers they wanted until over a decade later. In July of 2013, Boston law enforcement officials announced that they had gotten DNA evidence that tied DeSalvo to Sullivan's murder. After a DNA sample retrieved from DeSalvo's nephew was tested and revealed promising results, DeSalvo's remains were exhumed and DNA samples were pulled. The samples were then used to compare the semen samples found at the scene of Sullivan's murder in 1964. At the end of the procedure, Suffolk District Attorney Daniel F. Connolly, Massachusetts General Martha Coakley, and Boston Police Commissioner Edward F. Davis announced that the DNA results proved with 99.9% .9 certainty that the seminal fluid obtained from the Sullivan murder scene belonged to Albert DeSalvo. The DNA results tied DeSalvo to the murder of Mary Sullivan, but that did not quell the doubts of many people. Some people argued that while he was responsible for Sullivan's death, Albert DeSalvo didn't commit all the murders attributed to the Boston Strangler. They backed up his claim by pointing to the fact that the victims were spread across all ages and races, which was unlikely for serial killers. Some believe that a number of the murders were carried out by different people who decided to copy the Strangler's MO in order to cover their tracks. Susan Kelly, an author who had done intensive research into the Strangler case, argued in her book that the murders were committed by different people and not one person. The forensic lawyer who represented Richard DeSalvo, Albert's brother, and Diane Sullivan when the case was reopened in 2000, Elaine Whitfield Sharp, was also able to spot several inconsistencies in DeSalvo's confessions. Some of the things he said didn't match the crime scene evidence. For example, DeSalvo claimed he strangled Sullivan with his bare hands, but evidence showed she was strangled by ligature. DeSalvo was also wrong about the time of death for Sullivan and several other victims. Taking all of these into consideration, another school of thought believes that George Nassau, the inmate whom DeSalvo had first confessed to was a suspect in the case. Former prison psychiatrist Ames Roby, who handled both DeSalvo and Nassau, stated that Nassau was a misogynistic, psychopathic killer. She believed he was by far more likely to be the strangler than DeSalvo. In line with this, there have been speculations that Nassau was the real strangler, but he fed DeSalvo details of the murders to make his confession believable. People believe that DeSalvo knew he would get a life sentence for the Green Man crimes, so he chose to confess to the crimes of the Boston Strangler as well. He did this with the intention that Nassau would collect the reward money for information leading to the capture of the Boston Strangler. They believe that Nassau and DeSalvo planned to split the money among themselves so that DeSalvo could give his cut of the money to his wife and two children. In an interview with Boston Herald, George Nassau denied involvement in the murders and stated that the speculations had killed his chances for parole. To this day, there is still a disagreement between authors, crime experts, and law enforcement officials about whether DeSalvo was the only killer. Some believe he was, but others continue to ponder over the possibility that there were other murderers who are still in the wind. Like with many other serial killer stories, several documentaries and films surrounding the Boston Strangler have been made, the most recent of which is the 2023 Hulu movie titled Boston Strangler. The film sheds more light on Loretta McLaughlin and Jean Harris as the first people to connect the series of murders and break the story of the Boston Strangler.